I believe in miracles because I believe in God. You are responsible before God for today. God wants to show His power and His greatness in our lives. Welcome to the Ernest Angley Hour. So glad you could join us today. The message I have for you is we belong to God and God belongs to us. And the Lord promised to take care of all of our needs for time and eternity. I hope this message will be a great blessing to you. But to start, we have some good music and singing. It's Jaylana Phillips leaning on the everlasting arms. Tonight's message, I believe it's a very sobering message, thought-provoking, I trust. The Holy Spirit helped give me this message, the scriptures, the thoughts to go with it, and it's preparation for Jesus' return. We as children of God, servants of Christ, bridal company members, we must understand what's expected of us before his return. And it's all laid out in the word of God very clearly. You know, I talked in the opening about a child of God being free, yet a servant. How can that be? The word of God makes it clear. And a lot of emphasis in churches is focused on the free part being free. And yet, a lot of times it's neglected the part about belonging to God and being a servant. And when you neglect that part, you come up short. And the Word of God says so. Jesus' words say so. And you know, in this late, dark, spiritual hour that we live in, People ha can have every right or excuse they, they can think of to not keep in there with the Lord like they should. 
to not serve him as they should, to not sacrifice for him as they should. But it is that hour, a late, dark, sleepy, spiritually sleepy hour. And many people, they're falling under that spirit of spiritual slumber, growing very drowsy, And you can't afford to in this hour. And it's brought out in this message tonight. But to start this message, when a person comes to Calvary, we're going back to the very basics. When they come to Calvary, they are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That means forgiven and cleansed of all sin and unrighteousness, freed from all the guilt and condemnation to then be made miraculously born again, to be made sons and daughters of God. And it tells us in Romans 8, 17, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer for him, that we may be also glorified together. So you're an heir of Christ. What a privilege, what an opportunity. But in, this, in the next sentence, there's also suffering involved with being that child of God. You won't have an easy life here on this earth if you're a true child of God. You'll have tribulation, you'll have persecution, you will have sufferings. Follow along with me here in this. There's a definite pattern in where I'm taking you. Children of God, you're an heir of God. As an heir of God, you possess a divine heritage, which is called the New Testament will. Jesus is the testator. He would enact this will. He would put it into force by his death on the cross. It tells us in Hebrews 9, 16 and 17, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. If you have a rich uncle, none of it belongs to you until that rich uncle dies. But when he dies, then the inheritance is yours. In the New Testament will... God provides his children an inheritance, an incredible inheritance, many blessings, many benefits, not only for this life, but on into eternity. However, as the case is, many times with a will, often there are conditions to be met or requirements to be fulfilled that are laid out in the will before the beneficiary can receive the inheritance. So if that rich uncle leaves you all of his wealth, he may include certain stipulations that you have to meet in order for this inheritance to be yours. Tonight, I want to highlight some of the stipulations in the New Testament will that are attached to the benefits and the blessings in this will, for this life, and into eternity. The first stipulation, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You belong to God. He bought you with a price. The New Testament will which is a child of God's divine heritage, stipulates that even though you have been made free, you belong to God. How can this be? How can we be free and someone own us? Well, God sacrificed his only begotten son at Calvary. He used his son's shed blood to purchase your redemption to free you from Satan's bondage in sin's captivity. Being made free 
to fulfill your service unto the Lord and glorify the Lord in your body and spirit in this earthly life, your body. Paul goes further with this in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 22 and 23. He's speaking of children of God. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's freeman. So you are a servant of the Lord, and you're also the Lord's freeman. You're free. Likewise, also, he that is called, being free, is Christ's servant. Ye are bought with a price, the blood of Jesus. Be not ye the servants of men. The divine blood of Jesus has purchased every child of God. Your debt, your gratitude, O child of God, is unto the Lord, not unto any man. Unto the Lord. Because no man could pay such a debt that you owed and redeem your soul, only Jesus. Every child of God is to obey the word of the Lord over people's opinions, over their theories, over their philosophies. The word of God is paramount because you belong to God. It is important for every child of God to establish this in their mind. Being born new is not a guarantee that you will make it into heaven. Understand this. Understand what I'm saying. Your salvation experience is not the end of life's journey. Your salvation experience is only the beginning. Your redemption through the blood of Jesus, what that does for you, it qualifies you to start a journey that leads to heaven. Isaiah chapter 35, verse 8. And an highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. Hundreds of years later, after Isaiah the prophet wrote this, Jesus comes on the scene. And in the Sermon on the Mount, he expounds upon it. He called it the narrow way. Matthew 7, 14, Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. The narrow way that leads to heaven is a path of God's holiness, that the spiritually unclean cannot travel. They cannot put their spiritual feet upon this path. They must first be born again and cleansed of all sin to put their spiritual feet upon this path and start their journey to heaven. A person cannot live just any kind of life and follow the narrow way. This is why only few there be that find it. Child of God, you only have one life to live. Only one opportunity to travel the narrow way. And to help you on this journey, so that you don't lose your way, you don't stray, you don't detour and fail to reach heaven, God has provided a road map, and it's called the Bible. This is the map. It shows you how to travel the narrow way. It show, in other words, it shows you how to please God in your life, and how to be a blessing unto his kingdom in your life. Also, he has provided the Holy Ghost to live and dwell within children of God as they journey on the narrow way. Jesus said he would be a teacher and he would be a guide. And Jesus said it was necessary for the children of God to receive the Holy Ghost baptism. Because with the Holy Ghost in your life, he will guide you from day to day on this journey of the narrow way. Now, for a person to start out on the narrow way, traveling a spiritual path, 
that they are, un, they are completely unfamiliar with. Then to neglect the help, the tools that God has provided to make the journey, this can only be categorized as either foolish, arrogant, lazy, deceitful, or all of the above. To travel a path you've never traveled, provided tools to help make the journey and then neglect those tools, that's just utter foolishness. Many have tried to walk this way on their own, and they didn't make it. They lost their way. Taking shortcuts, detours, or a path of their own choosing. But there is only one way that leads to heaven. God's way. The narrow way. There are no detours, no shortcuts, and no turning back. Listen to this stipulation laid out in the New Testament will for children of God to collect their heritage. Hebrews 10, 38. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. You see, there's more to it than just being born again, receiving the Holy Ghost and living holy. You have to live by faith to be justified before God. For instance, you have to have divine love, first love manifesting in order to please God. Because remember the church at Ephesus, they avoided evil, they had great faith, did lots of works. Jesus still told them to repent because they didn't have first love. They had to repent. They had strayed off the narrow way because they lost first love. When the way becomes difficult on the narrow way and life is not to your satisfaction, don't think that you can step off the narrow way, take a shortcut in self, a detour in the flesh, make your own path and way and still think you're going to go to heaven. God takes no pleasure in disobedience. And this is what every child of God must have established within themselves. He takes no pleasure in disobedience. And I'm going to highlight this even more later in the message. The just travel the narrow way, living by faith in the word of God. Trusting the word to show them the way. I'm sure all of you can relate to this, but have you ever traveled a long distance, maybe to another state or another town you've never been to before? And in the past, you'd pull the map out. Today, it's a navigational system. So here you are, journeying to a place you've never been. You have your map, you have your navigational system. And it says, in a quarter of a mile, make a left. In two miles, make a right on Newton Street. Now, again, you've never been there before. And as the directions come, you obey. You are trusting in this map. You are trusting in this navigational system to show you to your destination. You blindly do what it says. How do you know you've never been there before? How do you know you can trust this? But you do. That's faith. That's human faith, but it's faith. This is the way we are to trust the word of God and trust the Holy Ghost. Our navigational system. Leading us, showing us the way to heaven to keep our feet on the narrow way so that we don't lose our way on the journey. The Word of God and the Holy Spirit, it's our map, it's our navigational system. And it's important to keep the Word close to you on this journey. 
Hide it in your heart. Obey it. Live by faith in what it tells you and how it instructs you. The word is important to navigate your way through this dangerous, dark world. It's filled with snares, pitfalls, and traps. You have Satan as a roaring lion, roaming about, seeking whom he may devour. And he walks close to the narrow way and the highway of holiness. Out of sight, but he, he stalks this road. For those who become careless and negligent, for those who become selfish, and those who want to go their own way, take that shortcut, take that detour, or those who become negligent, spiritually lazy, and start straying off that narrow way. Satan will stalk you, hoping to get you off just far enough from that path so that he can take you. Another stipulation in our New Testament will to receive our inheritance, the words of Jesus, He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life, unto life eternal. Here's the next phase of the message. Jesus says, if any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. So child of God, as you make this journey through life, who are you serving? I don't want to know if you're born again or if you've got the Holy Ghost. I want to know who are you serving day to day. I don't want to know about, oh, I'm living holy. I want to know who are you serving day to day. Is it Jesus? Is it a person in your life? Is it self? Who are you serving? Again, the stipulation is laid out by Jesus to inherit this divine heritage. Your divine heritage, the New Testament will, stipulates. It's laid out by Jesus himself, the one who paid the price to enact the will. Your primary purpose in this life is to serve the Lord of your own free choice. That's how you can be a free man and yet a servant. You serve the Lord, but you are to do it of your own free choice. God will not hold a gun to your head and say, I let my son be killed. You will serve me. He doesn't do that. Every person is of a free moral agent. They have the power to choose. So when you are born again, your feet are put on the narrow way, you have a choice to make. How will you make this journey? Will you follow the narrow way all the way that leads to heaven? Will you use the roadmap, the navigational system, the Holy Ghost, the Word of God? Jesus said, those who seek to lose their life in servitude unto him, they will preserve their life into eternity. That's how, you, that's how you lose your life. You lose it by freely giving it to Jesus in servitude. But those who save their life for selfish purposes and selfish gain, will lose it in the end. In the Gospels, Jesus tells many parables. And the definition of a parable is a simple story used to illustrate 
a spiritual lesson. And in putting this together, I went to different, many different parables throughout the four Gospels. And in some of these parables, Jesus, he likens himself to a master or a ruler of a house. His church, he likens to a household. His followers, to servants in his household. Now, in certain of these parables, the theme is somewhat the same, very familiar. The master, the ruler, goes on a long journey. And the servants of the house, they are responsible unto him, even though he's away. They are responsible to do their master's will, even when he's not present. Now, in studying these parables, the responsibilities include keeping the house in order, serving their fellow servants, increasing the talents that their Lord had given them before he left, forgiving their fellow servants of debts, just as their Lord had forgiven them, watching and being ever ready for their master's return. These are some of the responsibilities. But one spiritual lesson from all of these parables that Jesus taught that is true in all of them, that is, a child of God's life is not their own. Traveling the narrow way cannot be done for selfish reasons. Don't think, I want to go to heaven, I'm going to travel the narrow way. You travel the narrow way God's way. And as you do that, a servant of the Lord, you will reach your destination, heaven. It's time to boldly step out and let God be your financial partner. Invest in this Jesus Outreach Ministry. We not only reach out to the world, but also to your local community. Share with us your tithes and offerings, and let us send you free books, magazines, and our weekly broadcast. Take time to grow in grace win souls, and enjoy God's financial miracles for your family. God's way is perfect. Prove God and His promises. How often have people received salvation through Jesus Christ? They entered into that straight gate in the form of a cross. They set out on the narrow way, only to journey. And then over time, they lose their way. And they don't even realize it. They've strayed. And then one day they wake up in eternity. And the destination was not what they expected. 
Instead of living by faith in the word of God, a servant unto the Lord, they journeyed in selfishness, their confidence in the flesh. And the pride of their heart deceives them. And they lose their way and they don't even realize it. Following self and not the leadership of the Holy Ghost. How can you follow self in life on a journey you've never traveled and not lose your way? A servant of men and not a servant of Christ. Check your life daily with the word of God. Because of the path you travel, in other words, your lifestyle, your actions, your words, if they do not match the word of God, this reveals to you, the map is telling you, you've lost your way. You're not on that narrow way. Hebrews 11, verses 13 through 16. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have, to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Servants of the Lord who journey the narrow way, in this life they are pilgrims and strangers. They don't belong here. They're different from this world. Their desire is not any of the pride in this life. No, their desire is to serve their Lord in obedience because they desire a heavenly country and a city whose builder and maker is God. Look at the lives of these heroes in the faith in Hebrews 11. Examine them, each one. They live their life as freemen, yet servants. What do I mean? Well, look at Enoch. Enoch pleased God. He pleased God because he lived by faith. He served the Lord and was raptured. And he was the only one taken. Not his friends, not his neighbors, not his family members. He was the only one living by faith. And the Lord took him. Then you have Noah. He was a free man. God warned him of a coming flood. He believed God and he obeyed. In other words, Noah then proceeded to give his life in servitude to do the will of God and build an ark to the saving of his household. He was free, but yet he belonged to God in servitude. You have Abraham. He believed and obeyed God. When he was called out from his people and country to go and live in a place he did not know, a place that God chose. Again, he was free. He didn't have to do this, but when God called him, he believed and he obeyed. And he spent the rest of his life living in tents, tabernacles, roaming and wandering the promised land. A servant of the Lord. He chose to be a servant of the Lord. He did not choose his own path in life. God chose it for him and he walked it. Abraham steadfastly believed when God told him he would have a son by Sarah. And by that son, a great nation would arise to bless all nations. So Abraham obeys God when God commands him to sacrifice his son Isaac. 
This was not Abraham's choosing. Nor did God force him to do it, threaten him to sacrifice his son. He simply told Abraham to do it. And as a free man, he obeyed in servitude unto the Lord to even sacrifice his only son. Because God told him that his seed would be through Isaac, he knew God could not lie. And he knew God would raise him up. Abraham, a servant of the Lord, lived by faith, believing and obeying God. And it was counted unto him for righteousness. This is how he was justified before God. He believed God and he obeyed God. Same thing with Noah. He believed God, he obeyed him, it was counted unto him for righteousness. At this time, I want to take you back to make reference again to the topic of Jesus' parables pertaining to himself, all of his servants, and his house. At the end of most of these parables, Jesus would usually de detail in the parable how upon the master's return, the servants would then be summoned and they would have to give an account for themselves before their master. Give an account of their servitude before him. Standing before their master in judgment, these servants, as I rehearsed all of these parables in all four Gospels, these servants would be judged. Now, we're talking servants, not sinners, not hypocrites, not backsliders, servants in the house of the master. Standing in judgment when he returns, some are found to be wise and faithful. Some are found to be blessed. Others, good and faithful. While there are other servants in the Lord's house, Jesus judges them, or the master judges them as evil, unprofitable, wicked, and slothful. Take note. This is how the Lord labels his own servants. Then in judgment, the Lord rewards his worthy servants that did his will and obeyed him. But the unworthy servants, those who disobeyed, who did not his master's will, the evil, the unprofitable, the wicked, and the slothful servants, the master would then declare that their portion is with the sinners and hypocrites. Now, if you look up portion, that means fate. So these servants that were judged, their fate is with the sinners and the hypocrites. And they are to be cast out of the household into outer darkness. So by Jesus' parables, we understand that even though Jesus, our master, is away from us, we as his servants, in his household, we have certain definite responsibilities before him, even though he's not here. And he, even though he's not here, he's expecting us to meet those responsibilities. And in the future, we will give account for those responsibilities. In judgment, he will determine our fate. You see why Jesus said then in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Not every servant's going to make it. 
People can identify themselves as being a servant of the Lord, but only the obedient servants will enter into the kingdom. Child of God, yes, you may have been born again. You may, at one point in the past, been baptized in the Holy Ghost. But since then, how are you living? Are you studying your roadmap to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed before God, rightly dividing the word of truth? Have you quenched the Holy Spirit in your life, your navigational system that will guide you and direct you? What kind of servant are you unto the Lord? Lazy? Wicked? Evil? Unprofitable? Disobedient? You may think, how can someone like this be labeled like this and be a servant of the Lord? Look to the Word of God and find out for yourself because it's clearly laid out. And Jesus identifies in these parables why these servants were labeled as such. It's not a mystery. It's not hidden. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus warns in a parable of his return to his household and then judgment of his servants. And I take you to Luke chapter 12, verses 35 and 36. First, Jesus says, Let your loins be girded about, and your lights burning. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Your loins girded and your light burning. Where have we heard this before? In the word of God. What's the connection? What does it mean? Well, your loins girded. Go to Ephesians 6. The spiritual armor, your loins girded with truth. The road map. Your light burning. What keeps your light burning? Oil. The oil of the spirit. To be ready and stay ready, you need both. The truth, the word of God, your road map, and the Holy Ghost. Your navigational system. Are you dressed, ready, and watching? It's a late hour. It's a spiritually sleepy hour. People all around are succumbing to the spiritual drowsiness. Are you? Or are you determined to fight it? To pay whatever price to stay awake, to stay dressed, to be watching, to be ready? Truth and the spirit of truth. Both will keep you alert and ready in this late hour as we await Jesus' arrival. And when he does return, you will stand ready and you will be rewarded accordingly. Luke chapter 12, verses 37 and 38. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them, so blessed are those servants. I can never get over the scripture reading, no matter how many times I read it, to think of it, to think about what Jesus is saying here. Humble servants of the Lord in this life, then to be exalted by the Lord in the next. To then sit down at meat, and the master will come, lay aside his garments, his glory and his power, to gird himself and serve 
his servants in this great celebration. He will serve us. The faithful and wise servants who are responsible to their duties in this life, they will be made rulers over all that the master owns. And the master owns everything. This whole universe, he owns it all. But those servants who recognize their Lord's delay in returning and neglect their duties and mistreat their fellow servants and are disobedient and lazy and slothful and negligent, when the Lord returns, judgment will be pronounced upon these irresponsible servants and they will be counted as unbelievers. That's how the Lord will view them as an unbeliever, and they will be punished accordingly. Luke chapter 12, verse 47. And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. I tell you, it's a sobering message. It's a message of judgment, but it's also a message of mercy. So now that you know the Lord's will, what will you do with it? Will you prepare and serve accordingly? Or will you be negligent? Christ's judgment begins in his own house with his servants. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? Peter asks two sobering questions in this scripture reading. One, what is the end of them that do not obey the word of God? What is their end? Two, where will the sinner and the ungodly appear in all this? Peter notes that the righteous are scarcely saved. The righteous, scarcely saved. Scarcely means barely saved, almost not saved. This is a very humbling, sober thought. Child of God, your relationship with God, it begins with a boring again experience, but it doesn't end there. From there, it is about living a life of obedience unto his will, unto his word. Being bought with a price, that only heaven could afford to pay. You belong to God. And as Paul wrote, your life is not your own. We must see ourselves as God sees us. Because that's the only way we'll be able to please God and serve him accordingly. Friend, listening to this message tonight, examine your life in light of the words of Jesus, the master, and what he expects. Is your life in agreement, in accordance with the word and will of God? Or is your life one of selfishness, slothfulness, neglect of the things of God? Are you careful to keep the word of God close, to give the Holy Spirit liberty, or have you quenched the spirit and neglected the word? Examine yourself in this mirror. Look into this roadmap daily, lest you lose your way on the narrow way. And it be too late. But friend, I'm here to tell you, if there is any sin in your life, you're not on the narrow way. You may call yourself a Christian, but you cannot walk the highway of holiness with sin in your life. That's made clear in the Bible. No unclean thing can pass over this road. 
You must be born again to walk the narrow way. And it starts at the straight gate in the form of a cross. Come to Calvary. If there is a stirring in your heart this night, if there's any prick of conviction in your conscience, listen and yield. Let the Holy Spirit move for you and take you to Calvary. Pray this prayer with me tonight. Say, O oh God, save my soul. Forgive me for my sins. I am so sorry that I have sinned against you, but no more. I will serve you, Lord, the rest of my life. And I believe there is power in the blood of Jesus, power that washes away all of my sin. Say, come into my heart, Jesus. Come into my heart, dear Jesus. And amen. And friend, if you meant that prayer, Jesus is yours. And that's wonderful. The blood of Jesus redeeming your soul. Born again, brand new. And to walk this narrow way, the Lord wants to move for your body as well. To heal you. To make you whole for his honor and glory. And Jesus said his believers would lay hands on the sick and they would recover. And I'm the Lord's believer. Reverend Steve Millar here is the Lord's believer on the platform. Many believers here ready to agree with you. And I know many of you, you put your prayer requests in the comments section. And that's great. But regardless whether you did or not, put your hand against mine on the screen is a form of laying on of hands. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I bring the people before you tonight. Lord, we honor the blood that redemptive price paid for soul, mind, and body. And Lord, by the blood stripes, your word declares we are healed. Lay a healing hand upon each one. Make them whole. In the blood name of Jesus, heal. Heal in the holy blood name. Heal and let that virtue flow right where they are and move for their need, and make them well, Lord, for your honor and glory in the name of Jesus, and amen. And friend, you watch every sign of improvement and know God is moving. When you improve, that's your sign. God is working, he is moving to make you well, and give God glory for it. But you need the Holy Ghost. Oh, what a help on this journey. You must have the Holy Ghost. And if you don't have them, it's time to seek, to tarry before the Lord until you receive, because it's a gift. God said his baptism of the Holy Ghost is a gift to his children. Nothing besides salvation and holy living is required to receive this gift. It's, that's how necessary it is to make this journey to heaven. You must have the Holy Ghost, friend. But before I pray for you to receive the Holy Ghost baptism, anyone here tonight in need of prayer, at this time, feel free to get up, go over to the side. I'll be there to minister to you and the rest of you. Stand to your feet. Come to the altar tonight. Present yourself unto the Lord. Let the Lord bless you. Let him anoint you in a mighty way to serve him in even greater ways, to please him in even greater ways, to do his whole and perfect will. Because soon enough, our master will return. He will return and we will give an account. And let it be said of all of us here tonight that the Lord will judge us to be faithful and good servants. Well done, thou faithful and good servant. Enter into the joys of your Lord. That's the words I want to hear, and I'm sure that's the words you want to hear at the end of life's journey. Well done, faithful and good servant. And those of you, you need the Holy Ghost tonight. You need this power from on high. It's the only way, friend. You got to have it. Lift up your hands wherever you are. You may be at home. Stand to your feet.
It's time to praise the Lord. I'm going to ask the Lord to anoint you, to bless you, to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I call this anointing down upon them. Lord, anoint them to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, receive the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, receive the Holy Ghost. Friend, if you enjoy these messages going forth on the program, as well as the music and singing, well, I'd like to invite you to pay us a visit at Grace Cathedral. We always welcome visitors to worship the Lord with us. You'll have a great time as we worship the Lord in music and singing. The Word of God will go forth in preaching and teaching. And if there's a need in your life, you will have the opportunity to receive prayer at the end of the service. According to the word of God, Mark 16, believers will lay hands on the sick and they shall get well. We have three services every weekend, Friday night and two services on Sunday. Come friend, be greatly blessed. And don't forget now, if you're unable to be with us in person, you can join the service by way of the live stream. Go to our YouTube channel or our Facebook page, and there you can connect with us and enjoy the service live as the service goes forth. And you can receive prayer as well, because we pray for those who connect with us on the live stream. So you can put in your prayer request in the comments section and expect God to move for you. And don't forget, friend, to check out all our social media content. You can go to our Instagram page. We're always putting forth good spiritual content to bless you, to increase your faith. You can enjoy it any time of the day or night. And remember, friend, do help us. Keep the program on in your area. Help us to continue to win souls for Jesus. Go to our website, earnestangely.org, and there you can donate online, it's safe and secure, and what a blessing you will be to the Lord's kingdom. And in turn, the Lord will bless your life spiritually, physically, and financially. In fact, he promised to open up the windows of heaven upon your life and pour out blessings in abundance. So what you give is greatly needed and appreciated. And friend, if you enjoy the program or you have a great testimony, you'd like to share it with us, how God has moved for you through this Jesus ministry, we'd love to hear about it. Send it by email. You can send it to testimonies at earnestangely.org. Well, friend, I hope you were blessed today by this program. We look forward to seeing you again next week. Always remember, you are special to God. Every Friday on the Ernest Angley Ministries Facebook page, we invite the nations of the world to send in their prayer requests, and we cover them with prayer during our Friday night miracle service. People are responding by the thousands with great testimonies of blessing and deliverance. Need a job? Post a message. Have a sick child? Post a message. In despair? Post a message. Seeking the divine will of God? Battling drugs and alcohol? Remember, Jesus said all things are possible to him that believeth. Claim your miracle by joining us in prayer and then send us your praise report with a comment. It is that simple if you believe.